how to turn the volume up. Um, so this is Martin and Eloise talking about Python in the classroom. Awesome. Cool. Um, yep. Hello. So um, my name is Martin Henschke. This is um, Eloise. You probably know her better than you know me. Um, and um, today we're going to be talking about. Uh, there we go. Um, I'll just have to be there. Yep. Um, so yep, I'm a PhD student at ANU in Australia. Um, and yourself. Hi, I'm from Tasmania. I'm a web developer and a student. So I work part time as a web developer and. Yeah, still studying my computing degree. Yep. Um, so, yeah, we're just here today to talk to you a bit about um, a couple of trials that we've been doing and some um, experiments that we've run through um, that's been looking at using Python as a teaching resource in, uh, like, primary and high school classrooms, mostly. Um, so, kind of starting off this, like, this, this whole idea um, is sort of looking at literacy and numeracy rates, which is particularly near and dear to the heart of uh, Tasmanians um, in Australia. So, um, so literacy and numeracy are both, I think we can all agree, extremely important skills, particularly for the 21st century as we move further away from like um, more, you know, sort of uh, mechanical based jobs and sort of and, and that sort of thing. We're moving towards much more in intelligence based jobs where requirements to be able to process information um, and have good numeracy skills are become increasingly important um, as those, those other jobs sort of become automated and things. Um, so having really high levels of education is extremely important in, in schools today. Um, so the literacy rates when you look at it on, say, Wikipedia, which is where those two numbers came from, are fantastic. Um, New Zealand has a wonderful 99% um, literacy rate, which is very, very high. Um, Australia has 96%, which is still, still very good. Um, and that number sounds really fantastic until you dig a bit more into it. Um, so this graph comes from the, uh, the ABS, and it demonstrates the level of literacy that all Australians have. Um, and if you classify yourself as being literate, then you're level one or above. Level one is the ability to be able to understand brief bits of information or text um, that is on a familiar subject. So for example, being able to go shopping um, or something is something that you can do if you have that basic level of literacy. Um, but if you're looking at jobs that require like, you know, a, a sort of a more high level of being able to reading ability, then things like being able to process large amounts of information, possibly in web pages where you might have conflicting information going as well, that's closer to level three or four and that's getting closer to sort of 15% of the population that has that skill. So it's a lot lower than it looks like on the surface. Yeah, and so in Tasmania, in particular, where I'm from, um, a few years ago, it was reported uh, that we had about 68% functional illiteracy. Uh, liter sorry. So numbers certainly, while you know, can can probably have room for improvement, particularly sort of as we move on to this sort of uh, topic in the future. There we go. Um, so um, I'm not sure. Yeah, certainly in Australia and indeed many other parts in the world, um, there's a big push at the moment to try to get programming um, much much sort of deeper into the education system being much more common. Um, at the moment it's like a very, very small margin of schools will teach programming um, as part of their, their sort of broad curriculum. Um, it's becoming more prevalent, particularly in the UK where programs have been put through as well. It's being debated in Parliament in Australia at this very moment. Um, but um, yeah, it still has a little bit of a way to go. Yeah, as you guys saw the keynote this morning from Gok Learning, they're awesome. Um, I highly recommend a lot of their stuff. Um, so yeah, so it's, there's a big push for it and in the UK they've adopted it uh, where there's a lot of code clubs and things in Australia right now, um, but it hasn't quite got there yet. Um, but why to teach programming? I'm pretty sure that was semi-covered in the keynote this morning. Uh, it's not about uh, telling them that it's the new literacy, it's we try to approach it from the angle of maybe it will inspire them to want to be more literate. So. Uh, in Tasmania, there's, and possibly other places, there's a bit of a culture of uh, devaluing education. So there are actually people out there, I've, I've had friends making fun of me because I went to university because they just think it's, a, education is a waste of time. And I was luckily not brought up in that sort of environment. Uh, and I think it's a bit sad that they weren't either. Uh, I think education is great. And I strongly encourage everyone to, you know, be as educated as they possibly can. Um, but yeah, so there's a culture of devaluing education, and so people who might otherwise have like, wanted to go off and do those things are kind of told, no, don't do that. Um, and that makes me sad, and I can understand some of the reasons behind it, and so I thought maybe if we made a workshop to kind of teach them how to make a game, because a lot of kids really like games, that maybe they'll see that there's some uses for being literate other than just you know to go to school. Um, so yeah, so that's how the idea kind of came about. Um, I also wanted to help some other things, so I wanted to kind of
kind of push diversity as well. Uh, I wanted to go out to a lot of rural areas to help uh, the less well-funded primary schools and kind of get some coding workshops out there because I really want coding to be open to anyone and everyone. Uh, I was really sad. I came from a rural area and I didn't really get to do anything with coding until first year university, so I still feel very new and am playing catch up a lot of the time. Um, but yeah, so we wanted to try and get these students and see if they actually wanted to learn about programming. Uh, hopefully you'll find out that we did that and we did it okay. Uh, so we developed uh, a set of exercises. Uh, we'll find out about the tools we used to that in a bit. And we kind of, we gave those to the kids uh, to do. Uh, we basically just taught them uh, very basic kind of things, uh, you know, control structures and Boolean logic and just started from the basics to work their way up. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry. <laughs> so yeah, we, and then we wanted to give them something that they could then put all those skills and use. So Martin created a game. Yes. Um, so the, the tools that we use, we use Python 2.7 um, and Pygame. Um, in the situation where I had done this, I had up until that point never actually used Python, so I got to spend 36 hours learning to do so to make a game for kids, um, which was an, an enlightening experience, um, just in time for it to not matter, which is nice. Anyway, um, so um, yeah, so that, that was the tool that we used. I think that's been updated now to three, which is why I say it's, it's no longer quite as helpful as perhaps it once was. Um, that was the, yeah, yeah so, so we used that particular thing as well. For our teaching materials, um, we provided them using like a git book format. Yeah, so uh, last year I went to a Django Girls workshop. Uh, they're really great workshops. And they used git book to deliver all their content. Uh, and it's a really cool tool. I'm not sure if we can show it to you or not. I'm Maybe afraid later not. if you want to see it. <laughs> uh, or you can just Google git book now. You, most of you have laptops. And so yeah, it's basically like an online book. It's got chapters on the side. It has tick marks so that when students progress, through the thing, it has a tick and says, hey, you've already done that chapter. Um, yeah, it's basically just a book and you can format things nicely. The workshops may not be formatted as nicely as they could be. Um, yeah, so we tried to cover just, you know, very basic, simplistic programming um, concepts. Just enough to be able to get like a feel for not only how programming languages work, but also to give um, our students enough flexibility to be able to sort of play around with these sorts of things as well. So, you know, things like, you know, um, just basic variable declarations, manipulations, stuff like that. Um, you know, a bit of looping, a bit of like conditionals and tasking so they can make like little decision trees um, that they can use for making small games in their free time or, you know, just for, for sort of getting a, a vague idea for the general concept um, of those things. So really just a, like a, a, just a very broad just alt approach to just sort of these, these basic things with much more focus on, I guess, on the application of what they were doing as opposed to the actual theory, which I think is perhaps otherwise would have made the experience a little bit less interesting for the students. Um, that was sort of the focus we went from. Uh, where's the mouse going? There we go. Okay, um, so the game that I made, um, I had designed it in a way that it was supposed to be like a very basic ability to be able to interact with the world in, in, like, in like a casual way, but also had to be extendable. Um, so we wanted the students to be able to look at the code and say, um, when I walk left, I want the character's face to turn right. Or if I want them to look like a blob, as I want to look like a person. Um, if I read that sign, I want a little bit of text to pop up. And I wanted to have simplistic like sort of um, structures and macros. They could just modify the code very, very simplistically so they could put in those um, features as easily as possible. That was the sort of the, the, the idea behind this game. Um, yeah, so, so having this sort of very flexible infrastructure um, that would sort of inspire kids to be creative and to sort of, you know, build, build things the way they want to so they have their own sort of thing they can go from. Um, we also tried to build it to be as, I guess, self-documented and clear as possible so that if they wanted to, after the workshops were completed, they could go home and they could say, right, that was a lot of fun, let's see if I can make him, you know, go in this direction now, see if I can make him shoot bullets or something like that, um, as a, just as, as features they could possibly do in their own time. That was sort of the goal of that game, I think. Uh, yep, there we go. That was one of the other reasons we used Gitbook. Um, a lot of the workshops we did were split over, like, a few sessions uh, once a week. Um, and so if they had Gitbook, they're allowed to work ahead or, you know, catch up as much as they wanted to. We didn't want to control their pace too much because some people, like, already knew a lot of stuff and some people didn't. So Gitbook was a really good tool for them to be able to still be at the back of the class doing stuff. And we had mentors going around. So it didn't matter if they were lagging behind or just steaming ahead. We were still able to help them out. Absolutely. Oh, so... <laughs> 
So, uh, so with the first workshop, uh, we approached some schools. Uh, we ended up going back to my old school, which was exciting. Um, I was really lucky. I went to a private school, uh, and so it had all the resources for us. Because unfortunately, when we started this, we didn't have an army of laptops to take out to some of the uh, less well-resourced schools. <laughs> um, so yeah, they all had uh, laptops. They all had Macs. So. We didn't have to worry about installing Python initially. Um, it did mean that we were working with 2.7, which at the time wasn't a problem. Uh, since then, the workshop is being updated <laughs> to Python 3. Um, so yeah, and we had about 20 to 25 students, which was a lot, it turned out. So we were expecting maybe 10 to 15, but so many students apparently really wanted to learn to code uh, that the teachers just couldn't say no. Um, and yeah, so they each had their own MacBook and we just kind of uh, rocked up one day and ran the workshop. <laughs> we had two sessions of three hours, so in total it was a six hour thing, but we've worked out since then that a whole six hour day is not quite as effective and nowhere near as easy. <laughs> Yeah, um, the first thing we noticed when we did um, these trials is that a lot of these kids are already coding um, with almost no understanding of the fact that was, that was the case beforehand. Um, so a lot of them had been doing, or almost all of them I think, had actually had some exposure to Scratch um, and some of them made some pretty impressive stuff in that particular program. Um, Scratch, if you're unfamiliar with it, is a kind of like a, an IDE, but uh, it doesn't require to actually physically write code. You kind of just drop blocks um, into place and it will sort of and do the work for you. So you just sort of fill in the variables and the values and things and it'll, it'll work from there. Um, so it just removes the dangers of syntax errors and things um, and sort of has the structures sort of built out for you as well, some, some previous things. So they had all had some exposure to that. Um, they also, a lot of them had some exposure to Minecraft um, and so they had been doing some sort of very basic redstone stuff in that as well, which is sort of relevant, perhaps not quite so much. Um, but yeah, they were surprisingly computer literate um, and quite competent. Some um, of them knew how to play Tetris in Emacs. Yeah, I don't know how to do that. Amazing. <laughs> we were like, they were like, oh yeah, there's this awesome Tetris game. And I was like, you're using Emacs. Do you even know what this is? It was, it was quite impressive. Um, they've had the laptops for a while and they use them every day. So yes. I guess you find out stuff like that. So yeah, they, they, they knew more than I did about Macintoshes for certain. <laughs> um, but unfortunately, we discovered a lot of these skills did not translate well um, into Python directly. So even those who had like a lot of exposure to Scratch, um, apparently that drag drop structure just does not translate that clearly through concepts. And so when we actually gave them effectively the same code just without those little blocks, it was much harder for them to understand. So uh, there's, uh, I think there's a bit of a, a disconnect in terms of knowledge there that was quite important to acknowledge at the time um, in, in how that works. We found Scratch worked really well uh, to introduce programming before they can read and write. So maybe like year two is probably like nearing the end of that. Um, I've used, since then, I've, I've showed off Blockly a few times from Goth Learning, um, and that works a lot better because they've got really nicely formatted code. I think you might have seen it earlier today in the keynote. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of Blockly, sorry. Um, but yeah, Scratch just is a bit too much of a sideways step. Like I taught some kids uh, two weeks ago and they literally had Scratch up and they were doing the exact same thing as like we were showing them in Python. And it was just amazing the disconnect between that just cause like they weren't connected enough. Um, but I showed them Blockly and they seemed to just get it <laughs> as soon as that happened. So that's, that's one thing that Scratch I think could improve upon um, there. Um, so yeah, lots of kids kind of already know a lot. Like I think they're called natives, IT natives now or something. And, and that's great, but they don't, they're not really understanding what they're doing. Um, so that's always fun to deal with. We had some really fun questions uh, in our first workshop where one kid actually knew a bit of Python, which was really exciting, um, but he really liked Scratch as well. And so one kid asked him if Python was more powerful than Scratch. And this kid was like, well, Python's really cool but Scratch is more powerful. So that led to some really interesting discussions. Um, and I can understand where they're coming from. It's uh, instant gratification for them in Scratch. Uh, we had to do a bit of explaining on the Python side of things. Um, but yeah, so we, we figured out that we don't really want to use Scratch <laughs> anymore. Um, but yeah, so the teachers really loved the workshop. They instantly drew parallels between kind of grammar and syntax and programming languages. Also, when you teach Hello World programs, you make sure that they 
put proper grammar and capital letters and teachers really, really love that. Um, but yeah, we found our game wasn't as successful as it could have been. Yeah, um, I blame that mostly on Pygame. Um, the, big, the big problem with um, those libraries is because they use object orientation, which is a difficult thing to get through in two, three hour workshops um, to, to people who are still trying to understand what a variable is in, in programming, um, is the fact that as a consequence, a lot of the Pygame code that I wrote uh, looks rather complex, um, perhaps a bit too much for after six hours of, of Python teaching to be able to do that much with it. So as a consequence, um, it was difficult for students to comprehend it. So instead of making that a like a take home task or like a play around thing, um, we did a thing where we just sort of had the code on the screen and then I would show changes that the kids wanted to make and then I just sort of performed. So they could sort of see how making modifications to the program would you know, Im impact the way that it played or the way that it was interacting and stuff. So yeah, and so the kids would ask, okay, let's make the person a blob and then, and then say, okay, let's give the blob a wife or something. Um, and it would just be these sorts of little things that sort of go back and forth. We had to sort of show them just by adding little lines of code. So although it didn't give them the chance to really do that much themselves, which is really unfortunate, that's kind of why we did it, um, it still gave them a good uh, appreciation of just you know these small little changes that can make sort of very powerful impacts on the program and and indeed that just that general like agency that you have as a programmer uh, when you're interacting I think which I think uh, was still quite beneficial um, which is really nice it also really demonstrates I think um, be because things like Scratch and, and and like Minecraft are so popular um, with children and they're the, being used these vectors for teaching these concepts um, that those really interactive, engaging ways, particularly in like those sort of, you know, almost game-like environments, are a really excellent way of connecting with these students. Um, if we just sort of try to sit them down and say, all right, we're going to cover some C code for all this week, um, they will be, you know, asleep by Tuesday. So, um, so again, I just being able to present it in such an interactive way and, and, and sort of that, that very fun sort of way, I think had a really good impact on helping, the, um, on helping uh, the people that we were talking to really sort of get their head around these concepts in a, in a way that they found really engaging. So, so that was one of the big benefits, I think, that I had. Um, and yeah, I think in the future, it would be able to, if we can find some way of being able to refine that down a bit, that would be a fantastic concept to move on with. Yeah, we've, uh, we're working on rewriting the entire Pi game to make it more modular, the, the game we made in Pi game anyway, to make it more modular, just so there is more understandable bits. Because uh, they've done some amazing things with it, like some kids have just taken it and run with it. Um, and it's always really interesting going to look at their code afterwards, because they just put things in they, they sort of make sense, but they're in really odd places. Like uh, the one of the slides we had before had uh, an example of a student's work, and they'd made a second player, uh, a blob, uh, as a pet, and it follows them around. And then it also can be controlled by the uh, WASD keys, while the first player controls the arrow keys. Um, but the way they'd done that was they hadn't actually altered, like any of the other code, they'd just gone straight to main.py and put it all into there, um, which was good. I was so proud of them for figuring out how to do it. <laughs> um, but it was interesting listening to them explain why they put it there. And it was basically because that's how they got it to work, <laughs> rather than any other reason. Um, but yeah, so we've also found uh, since we've taught Python, some students have decided that they don't like Python. Uh, which is sad, but you know, understandable that if you if you don't like it, you don't like it. Uh, I don't think their reasoning was great, but they'll work on that. Um, <laughs> they they decided they didn't like Python so much that they would use Python to write their own programming language, which was really impressive. Uh, it was basically uh, they just made shapes effectively. I think they just made a turtle kind of thing. Um, and they use Python, but it's like to make their own language. Uh, it was they entered it for a competition. And I think they did pretty well, but it was it was extremely satisfying to see them do that, even if they did say they hated Python. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we've seen a lot of really good things come from this. Uh, so some students actually don't really like playing with the game; they just haven't been that into it. Uh, from that, they've decided instead to make text adventures. Um, so I think one of the slides a little while ago also showed one of those, and they've just made like ridiculously long text adventures, which is really good because it really worked into the whole literacy thing. Um, I feel like those students may have been quite literate before anyway, but uh, it was really good to see them explore kind of other avenues in their creativity just using programming. And they always get so excited as soon as they get anything to print as well. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, no, absolutely. The, the outcomes, uh, I think, broadly speaking, were really, really positive. Um, so yeah, one of the big questions we were, so I guess we are sort of near the top here, is like say, can we use Python uh, as a good tool engagement in schools? It turns out, yes, it's a fantastic language to use in schools. Um, I think it's the thing- exactly revolutionary, we know. Yeah, no, no, this is, this is, this is not news to anyone, I understand, um, but it was to me when, when we did this. Um, but yeah, um, it was really fortunately very easy to pick up most of the syntax in Python, one or two things, particularly the white spacing was challenging for a few kids. Um, but broadly speaking, um, that combined with, you know, just having a little bit less um, you know, structures in the way and boilerplate and stuff in the way just made this a really, I guess, very dynamic and easy sort of environment to work with that, that made this a fantastic option for schools. Um, it's, like I say, I guess it's early days to, to, to talk about, you know, in, 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 I guess, more disadvantaged schools and seeing if this is going to have much benefits there as, as it did here. Um, but yeah, I would say this is, on the whole, looks like a very positive step in, 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 in that sort of direction. So many more of these to come in the future. All goes well. Yeah. Anything to add? still getting lots of requests from schools in Tasmania to do more of these workshops, which is really exciting because uh, Tasmania recently got Code Club. It's some sort of international club to get students coding. I don't actually know a lot about it, uh, but Tasmania, the Tasmanian government made a deal and they now have 25% of Australia's Code Clubs, which is pretty impressive because Australia, uh, Tasmania is very small. We only have like 500,000 people or something. Um, and they just taught their 1,000 students so I thought with Code Club we wouldn't really need to do these workshops anymore, but apparently people still really like learning about Python as well because Code Club seems to mostly do Scratch. So it's really nice seeing teachers want to take that next step. And the students as well, they seem to really love it. Yeah, um, all very fantastic. I think that's our talk. Thank you very much for listening. So does anyone have any questions? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh yes, of course. Hello. <laughs> okay. Um, so in teaching Pygame in the past, one of the things that the kids found really confusing was having to write your own event loop um, to handle each event that Pygame uh, throws at you. And I'm assuming you handled that by just giving them the code for the event loop because you started off with I was not okay. teaching them event loops, yeah. yeah. No, it was good. Um, so when I've taught Pygame in the past, it's been the kind of, okay, this is the event loop, and then you sort mm -hmm. of build up the game from scratch rather than starting with a complete game and then modifying, which is interesting. Um, but the if you've uh, there is a new thing out now called Pygame Zero. Someone is writing a wrapper around Pygame to greatly simplify it ah. and make it easier to use. Um, so I would highly recommend that. Yes, thank you very much. Sorry, um, I, was not I haven't told you about that yet. Yeah, I was not aware of that. No, that's, that's good to know. Um, the, yeah, so the way that we handled the event thing, just in case, um, like, we tried to abstract that out as much as possible. So we didn't really mention that there was, like, a loop running around the program. We just kind of said, look, when you press the W key, this section of code executes, and we just sort of went from there, I think. Yeah. Some kids uh, really enjoy... Uh, so when you kind of get to the end of the workshop and there's not as many questions coming in all the time, uh, that you do get the chance to just sit with some kids and just explain oh all the different kind of files and all the different code. And yeah, so it's sometimes exciting. That is really fun. Mm -hmm. um, but by that stage, when they're getting that curious, I don't know, they seem to pick it up easier, or at least they pretend they pick it up a lot easier. And it's always interesting to see them implement themselves. Um, in a very similar vein, this is on, hello. Yes. yes. Um, there's a thing called Piglet. Pi? Or Pi, Pi, Glit. Oh, is it? I don't know. Might have been a couple of years ago, but I was using it and it was quite good. Sorry, microphone. Uh, when, it, when Piglet first came out, I was like, this is amazing. This is like Pi game, only much easier to use and cleaner and better. Um, but it seemed to stop development. It would then became impossible to use with newer versions of Python, and I haven't seen it get picked up again, but if it is picked up again, that would be a good alternative. Uh. Yeah, I don't think I've heard a lot about Piglet, Piglet. I haven't heard a lot about Piglet, Piglet, Piglet. Piglet. We've decided, everybody, it's Piglet. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I don't think I've heard a lot about Piglet. Uh, It'd be great if it's still in development, but uh, yeah, but from what I've seen of Pi Game Zero, it is really good. It's had a commit in the last two days. Piglet? Yeah. Ah, oh, maybe it is still. <laughs> and it seems to be uh, dealing with Python 3 as well. Ah. Oh. Oh. 
Um, just wondering if you, you mentioned that, that some of the really, um, or you alluded to the fact that some of the really meaty discussion that you had with people was after the kind of majority of the questions died down, you're able to start explaining stuff to people. Have you looked at maybe, um, you know, the, the order in which things are introduced maybe to, to try to kind of address some of those things or maybe have it write down some of your explanations so that you don't have, so people can learn after the fact? Um, yeah, so one of the reasons we use Gitbook uh, was so because the way Gango Girls host it, uh, they can submit uh, pull requests and so they can change it. So when we do workshops, uh, we update things as we go. Uh, that's not completely working at the moment because um, we're moving things over to change, make some major changes at the moment. Um, but yeah, that is something we address. Like every workshop, there's always a new question. Um, so we're developing kind of a frequently asked question and like building it into the workshop as we go along because I mean me and Martin uh, we kind of first time teachers like I've coached sports and things before but that's just nowhere near the same as trying to teach programming to first children. time primary school teacher yeah. certainly <laughs> um, yeah that was one of the things we found with the workshop as well having mentors like when you teach primary school children it's really good to have a ton of other helpers so because the way we run it which I think I was supposed to say earlier um, was we'd have one person up the front kind of working through at a, you know, a reasonably steady pace, just going through the things, um, and then children could yell, scream, shout, or preferably just raise their hand nicely. That doesn't always happen. Um, and then somebody else would go and help them so that you kind of had a lot of things going on uh, at any one time. Um, and that was one of the problems with our first workshop. There was only two of us, and we had... 25 children. I think we actually started with 30, but thankfully some had like some sports carnival to go to, so we didn't have them for very long. Um, so yeah, can never recommend enough having a million volunteers. <laughs> yes. Any further questions? No. That's awesome. Uh, a minute after doing tea. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.